I was, and still am, a huge conspiracy guy. I literally ran out of new tin hat topics to research, and I still wouldn't look at this one without embarrassment. But every time I glanced at it, there was something unresolved. And well everyone, into the breach again. Greetings from Northern Michigan, this is Bob the Science Guy. Today we're going to have a look at Mark Sargent, Flat Earth Clues, Episode 9. Apparently Mark wasn't confused enough about flight paths in Episode 7 that he had to do another one. We'll see if we can clear this up for him. Let's cue the music and get started. Part 9, The Magic Show. This is part of a series of clues that can help you get your head around both the design of the flat earth system we live in and who has been involved in the deception to hide it from you. This flat earth perspective initially started out as a problem solving exercise that was going to be built into clue 7, otherwise known as the long haul. But after some research and a little patience, it has evolved into something that warranted its own section and is a perfect example of good things come to those who wait. So emails and phone calls have been coming in, almost all of them positive. Several people from around the world commented on the southern plain routes. They said that while 95 percent of the long routes in that hemisphere were connections, which in itself raises red flags, there were a few pesky non-stops that seemed to contradict the overall logic. The well, Mark, the southern plain routes do contradict the overall logic because, quite frankly, your logic is wrong. There are non-stop southern plain routes, including this one from Sydney, Australia to Cape Town, South Africa. I actually had a friend of mine take this particular flight not a month ago. These non-stop flights are not only readily available, you actually had to overlook them to get your examples from Episode 7. The question then posed to me was, obviously, are they real flights? Could they be put there to throw the Flat Earth group off? If it was a trick, could I figure out what it was and how it was accomplished? I accepted the challenge and started my impression of Morgan Freeman as he went up against the Four Horsemen magician crew. Now, admittedly, I was skeptical to start, because the flights went against the third rule, that being the Flat Earth has no shortcuts. Only a globe has shortcuts. Well, Mark, that should be a really, really big hint for you, and a red flag. There are shortcuts on the Earth, because... The Earth is a globe. It's not flat. But they're not really shortcuts. What they are is straight lines between two points on a sphere form what's called a great circle course. And here's several examples of what a great circle is. But please, do carry on. As in magic, I had to assume the rule was not being broken, but only hidden, or having the illusion of being broken. But first, I had to see the trick itself. I had to see the planes in question and see them make the route. Anyone can list a flight, but does it actually go from point A to point B? With the help of several other people, this was then put to the test. While just about everyone with a cell phone knows about GPS and how it can track things, many people don't know that even though it's a system built by the military, there is a very public aspect to it. So while your phone is tracked at all times, so are other things, most notably all air traffic. By the way, here is Greater Sapien. He not only took that flight from Sydney, Australia to Cape Town, South Africa, he recorded it on video and on GPS the entire way. But this brings up your very first misunderstanding, Mark. GPS does not track people. GPS is a receiver that tells you where the receiver is. So, for example, if I open up my phone and ask it to locate me, it'll tell me I'm sitting in my living room in my house. But the GPS portion of that phone isn't going to tell you or anybody else where that house is. It just tells me where it is because I'm holding the phone. Now, for example, in order for you to know where my house is, 
something on my phone has got to pass that information along to something that you can read. But that involves another part of the phone transmitting that information. The GPS itself is only a receiver. Now, if you're military, you could view military planes. If you work at a cargo carrier like UPS or FedEx, you can view transport planes. The general public is mostly limited to commercial air traffic. This can be viewed in several places, and the one I chose was planefinder.net. You can use others like FlightAware, FlightRadar24, FlightTracker. It makes no difference because they are all tied into the same exact GPS system. All these sites do basically the same thing. Track every commercial plane in the world from start to end in real time. Okay, first of all, Mark, you simply do not understand how aircraft positioning works. It's pretty apparent from your video that you haven't looked into this at all. So I'm going to tell you how they work. This is not a subject of debate. This is not an opinion. This is how the aircraft positioning system works. Pay attention. So in this illustration, we have two aircraft that are within radio range of each other. They both receive their position from a GPS satellite. Now, in reality, it's four different GPS satellites to give a precise location and altitude for an aircraft, but you get the picture. So they find out where they are by receiving the GPS signal and then translating that in the cockpit to a latitude and longitude. That goes into a box in the cockpit. Now, that box, in turn, transmits that information along with the four-digit aircraft identification code. That information is transmitted, and any aircraft that has the equipment to receive it, or any ground station that has the equipment to receive it, will then get it and know exactly what aircraft is where at what altitude. So here's the implication behind this. If you are flying along in the middle of the ocean, Unless you are flying within range of another aircraft that can receive these signals, or within range of a ground station that can receive the signals, it's going to have to give an estimated position for you. This is why aircraft flying long distances over open water have what's called reporting points. So basically, if you leave New Zealand heading east, within a couple of hundred miles of the coast, you're going to go outside the range of the radars and receivers on New Zealand. Then you're basically on your own. So what happens is, is every 500 miles or so, about once an hour or possibly even more frequently, you will, your path will cross a reporting point that you have set up on your flight plan. That's your clue to go ahead and give your company a call saying, hey, I'm at reporting point alpha or reporting point charlie and then they know more or less where you are so if you don't show up they know where you were the last time you talked to them so i spend day after day looking at the plane finder global map which you see here at any given time it's tracking between three to seven thousand flights that are en route anywhere in the world you'll notice two different colors for planes red and yellow. Yellow just means there's a five minute delay in processing and only applies to the United States. The point here is in order to prove out these flights that go against flat earth theory, I need to watch a few as they cross either the South Pacific or Indian Oceans. The web page updates automatically, but just to be sure, I close and reopen the page every 30 minutes or so and wait for an ocean plane. And I wait, and I wait, and I wait some more. Hours pass, days pass, and no red planes to entertain me. And somewhere in this process of me just staring at these empty oceans, waiting for a plane to cross, something occurs to me. Can you guess what it is? Okay, Mark, well, actually, I have absolutely no idea what you would have done. I'll tell you what I would have done, though. If I was looking for aircraft and I wasn't seeing them where I would expect them, I would probably figure out, well, 
How should I be seeing these aircraft? Do I understand the technology behind it? And then I would have read up on the uh, ADS-B system that I alluded to, and I would have learned that I shouldn't see these aircraft over the middle of the ocean for very obvious reasons. Then I probably would have figured out, well, how would they report their position, and is that something that I could access? But then again, my goal was to figure out where the airplanes were. My goal was not to support the flat earth narrative as yours is. Nothing is crossing these oceans. Not non-stops, connections, multiple connections, nothing. But that's not possible, right? The planes have to reach their destinations. So I change gears and just watch the coastlines of anything in the southern hemisphere. And I start to see it. I follow a simple plane out of Brazil on its way to South Africa, which, by the way, is not part of the long-haul argument. It's offshore just a few hundred miles. I get something to drink, and when I come back, it's gone. Hmm. Just a glitch, right? So I follow another, and another, and the same thing happens again and again. Once the plane reaches an imaginary line in the water, GPS makes it disappear. No, Mark. Once again, GPS doesn't tell anybody where you are. It tells you where you are. It's a receiver only. It does not transmit. Now, as I pointed out when I explained the ABS-B system to you, in order to have that position transmitted to a station, there must be a station or an aircraft within range. This follows exactly what you're seeing. Had you spent five minutes and looked into how aircraft transponders worked, you would have saved yourself all this trouble and not even had to make this video. But alas, Mark, you didn't do that. So, I'm going to switch gears and just watch you dig yourself a little deeper hole here. And I'm going to do it for no reason other than sheer morbid curiosity and amusement. Then a friend who is also working on this problem sends me some links, which I've included in the description. I encourage you to take a look at them. At first, they don't seem like much, just an average flight log showing speed, altitude, locations, things you could expect. Then you scroll down to about 3.30 in the morning, and the location drops away, and is replaced by either the word approximate or the word estimated. All right, Mark, I'll just go ahead and put that track up for you. Here is a flight from Sydney, Australia, up to Dallas-Fort Worth in the United States. Notice that the green portion of this is followed by a purple portion, and then over land we have a green portion again, a purple portion, and then we've got a long green portion, and then we've got a purple por portion right off the coast of California. Please notice that the green portions are pretty much near land and transmission facilities, and the purple portions are out over the open ocean, including one right next to the United States up there just offshore. Looking at that another way, here is the flight and speed record of that flight. Notice that some gaps do exist in this because the receivers were too far away to receive the transmitted data. And this is what you would expect over a large body of open water like an ocean. Or at least you would if you had any understanding of how the data was handled. This then continues for the next five hours until, miraculously, one hour before landing, the flight log reestablishes itself, and the GPS system shows the plane in real time about to reach its destination. So to be clear to those who may not be seeing everything here, the flights are being dropped off GPS, and their flight data is also turned off and stays off until they are almost on top of their arrival point. And you say, well, that's how GPS works. No, Mark, that is not how it works. GPS sends signals out from four or more satellites. 
there is a receiver in an aircraft that receives those signals and translates it into a position and an altitude. It then transmits that information along with the four-digit transponder code for the aircraft to a box that is part of the ADS-B system. That box transmits that information to aircraft and ground stations that are within range. If there are no aircraft or ground stations, especially within range, that aircraft will not appear on FlightAware until that signal is received by a station. But the entire time, the crew in the cockpit is receiving the GPS information and knows where they are. This really isn't all that complicated. It only takes about five minutes to do the research to understand this and why you don't see aircraft on FlightAware in the middle of the ocean. All you have to do is ask a question on Quora. There's actually one that's right there. Just look at it. Well, no, because the Northern Hemisphere has planes flying all over their oceans. And then you say that maybe it's a localized Southern Hemisphere thing. And I say, then why are all the flights over or near land perfectly tracked? Furthermore, this is a U.S.-based system, with Americans flying on vacation every single day. You're telling me that those people aren't going to be tracked? Oh, for God's sakes, Mark, just read it yourself. Just take a minute. All right, read this. I'll wait. In addition, the Vanishing Plane Act is happening to not only the South Pacific and Indian Oceans, which I would expect, but also the South Atlantic, which isn't part of the Flat Earth argument. There are a bunch of flights that cross this relatively small ocean between South America and Africa, and every one of the planes is hidden shortly after takeoff. So then you say, what would be the purpose of hiding those shorter routes in the Atlantic? It's because of something I didn't see right away. If you hide one flight, you have to hide them all. Or perhaps because they use the exact same technology that has the exact same limitations that you had, could have found had you done five minutes of research for this video instead of put out something to support your flat earth narrative? Showing the GPS routes in the Atlantic but leaving out the Pacific and Indian Oceans would raise different questions. So the logic here, despite being very sneaky, is sound. The third rule is that the Flat Earth has no shortcuts. If you look at the azimuthal equidistant map again and look close, you notice that while the South Pacific, South Atlantic, and Indian Oceans make up the lower sections on a globe, they make up the outer ring on a flat model. In that model, there is no shortcut between Australia and South America. If you are creating flight routes, you have only two choices. You take the long way around, clockwise or counterclockwise, and stay on the ocean. Or you cut across the land in the middle. But if you cut across the land, you have to create connections, because on a globe, it wouldn't make sense to fly over the top of the United States to get to South America. This is just killing me, Mark. On a globe, this is the shortest distance between Sydney, Australia and Cape Town, South Africa. It is the actual distance that is flown by the airline that flies this route. It is over water. It is not over the North Pole as it would be on a Gleason AE map of the quote-unquote flat Earth. Do you honestly think that people on that aircraft can't tell the difference between flying over the ocean and flying over the North Pole. 
I mean, seriously, Mark, this goes over the ocean. Did you even bother to check, or are you just winging it? Here's an exercise for you. I want you to take a string on a globe and stretch it from Taiwan to San Francisco, California. And then I want you to get on a video and tell everybody why, if you have a problem halfway through that flight, you divert to Anchorage, Alaska, rather than Honolulu, Hawaii. Great Circle courses on a globe follow a very specific path. That path has landmarks, like land masses along it. It's not difficult to tell where you are. And it is not difficult to tell if you are over the southern Indian Ocean or the North Pole. Neither of these choices are ideal. So the authority came up with a compromise. Disable GPS and lose the planes for every ocean flight in the southern hemisphere. Then reactivate them once the destination is reached. Or how about you just leave the GPS on, Mark, so you know where you're going and let it do its job. Its job is not to do something that you want it to do so that it appears on flight tracker software. That's not how flights are tracked. Next time you make one of these videos, Mark, please, I beg you, do some research. Talk to somebody who knows something about the subject before you go on record making a fool of yourself. This is just one of the lengths that they are willing to use to keep you from seeing it. Don't just hide some things. Hide everything so that maybe the topic isn't addressed. And some would come back and say, well, nice going. You've just pointed out a flaw in their system, and sooner or later, they will fix the gap. Hmm, maybe. But not soon, I think. Actually, Mark, they are doing something about it. In 2017, they started a system that had a satellite uplink. So instead of being tied to an aircraft or a ground station within range, the positions could be reported directly via satellite. It's not in widespread use yet, but it's under development. Not because they're really interested in making flight-aware software more accurate so that you can sit down and see how wrong you are, but mostly for safety and tracking reasons. I'm going to go ahead and end it there because this is just starting to give me ulcer disease. So. This is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you for stopping by and be sure to like and subscribe to my channel. This rabbit hole's too deep for me. Feel my brain getting real sore.